Hello, welcome back to our last set of notes in our Earth's History Unit. This section is about absolute dating, um, while all the other sections we've done so far have been about relative dating. So now we're going to learn how geologists are able to find the actual date of um, any kind of fossil or rock layer using something called half-life and radioactive decay. So what is radioactive dating? So this is what the method that geologists use to get the absolute or, abs or actual age of a rock. So it's kind of like how we have a birth certificate that shows our actual age. So scientists use this technique to get the actual age of a rock or a fossil. So some of the definitions we need to discuss um, are radioactive isotopes. So radioactive means that something is unstable and it naturally then breaks down into something more stable. Okay, so our radioactive isotope is called the unstable parent element and the decay product is called the stable daughter element. And on the front cover of your reference table, there's a section on this that you could pull out to take a look at, otherwise we will also go over it in class. So this is the reference table section for radioactive decay. Um, you see here we have our radioactive isotopes. So these are the unstable uh, parent isotopes. And here is the disintegration, which is what it breaks down into. So this is what it decays into. This is the decay reaction. And then the half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of the unstable parent to change into the stable daughter. The stable daughters are on the right side. So carbon-14, for example, the symbol is C14, it changes into nitrogen-14, N14, and this takes 5.7 times 10 to the 3 years. So this uh, scientific notation, it tells us how many places to move our decimal to the right. So in this case, it's three places, one, two, three. So this would be 5,700 years. In the case of potassium-40, it takes 1.3 times 10 to the nine years. So we move our decimal nine places to the right. Okay, so that means we're gonna have eight zeros after this three. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we end up with one, billion three hundred thousand years so you could see that as we go down this list here each of them takes a little bit longer carbon 14 is most useful for um, fossils or rocks that are less than 60,000 years old because it breaks down pretty quickly compared to the others okay so this is used for recently living um, isotopes rocks fossils so using your reference table, we can complete this little graphic organizer. 
We're going to list each of the unstable parents that are in your reference table and then the stable daughter decay product that they change into along with the amount of time in years. So we're going to break down each of those scientific notations into the actual amount of years. Um, so carbon-14 changes into nitrogen-14 in 5,700 years. Potassium-40 has two possible products, argon-40 or calcium-40. And remember, each of these chemical symbols you can find on the bottom of page one of your reference table or on the back page in the chemical symbol area. And then we're going to put in our number of years, and we're going to list each of these. So take a moment, pause on this page, copy it down, look at that reference table, and we'll do so, some more practice with this in class. Super important term is a half-life. And it's kind of where is what it sounds like. A half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of the unstable radioactive parent atoms to change into the daughter product. Okay, so the amount of time it takes for half to change. So what can be done to change the half-life of a radioactive isotope? And what, the reason why this is such an important concept uh, using the half-lives is because nothing changes it. It is a completely stable process. Nothing changes it. You can, not more pressure, not more heat. Radioactive isotopes half-lives are completely constant. So they are a reliable measure of the age of a rock or a fossil. Okay, so we can use these reliably. So to say this in another way, why are radioactive isotopes useful to determining ages of rocks? It is because these half-lives are constant. So it is a, a very uh, secure and guaranteed method to use to date rocks reliably. So we're going to do a little bit of shading in to kind of get the idea of how radioactive decay works. So when we have a rock originally form, Okay, it's going, we're going to assume that it is 100% of a radioactive isotope. So in our example here, we're going to use carbon-14. Okay, so if our rock is born, in quotes, okay, originally formed, it is going to have 100% um, carbon-14. So that we're looking at this as being our rock, okay, or fossil, it doesn't matter. So if you count the boxes, right now we have 16 of these atoms, our parent, which means it's the radioactive parent. And the um, daughter, we're going to use, we're going to shade in for this example. So right now it's 100% carbon-14. So this would be, again, it's zero years old. It just formed. So 100% is parent carbon-14 and 0% is the stable daughter. When one half-life goes by, so if we're using carbon-14 as our example, one half-life going by would mean that this is now, the rock is 5,700 years old. At one half-life, half of the radioactive atoms are going to change into the stable product, which would be nitrogen-14. Okay, so now... Our ratio here, out of our 16 atoms, half have changed into the radioactive, uh, and the stable daughter. So we now have eight atoms of the parent um, isotope and eight atoms of the daughter isotope. So there's still 16 atoms. We still have the whole rock there, but the, the, uh, what it's made up of, the composition, has changed to 50% of our uh, parent and 50% of the daughter. So if you find a rock that has half and half of a radioactive and parent isotope composition, that would tell the scientist how old that rock is. They could determine it had one half life had gone by, and they would know that that rock was 5,700 years old if it was the carbon ratio they were looking at. Okay, the second half life goes by. So if we were using carbon-14 as our radioactive parent and nitrogen-14 as the daughter, we at hit two half lives means 5,700 years two times. So our rock is going to now be 11,400 years old. Okay, and now remember how this works half life means half of the radioactive 
atoms have changed into the stable daughter. So we were left after the first half-life with eight radioactive atoms. So now half of those are going to change. So four of those will change into the daughter. So now of our original 16 atoms, we now have four parents left and now 12 have changed into the daughter. So at 11,400 years old, in the case of carbon-14, we now have 75% of the atoms are going to be the daughter, and only 25% have remained the parent element. Now we could predict on the next round, on the third half-life, how many of these atoms are going to change into the stable daughter. So we have four remaining. So how many change over? Half. So that means two of these on the third half-life will change into the uh, stable product. So here we are, that's the third half-life. So three half-lives for carbon would be 5,700 times three. Okay, so we're now at 17,100 years old. If we found a rock with 17,100 years old that had the following ratio that we're gonna, about to do, we would be able to determine its age. So we, had, we know that we were going to have two more changeover from our second half-life, since there were four left before, and only two now remain the parent element. So two parents are left, 14 daughters. Okay, so now our ratio is 12.5% parent to 87.5% daughter. Notice it's always 100% the total, right? These two are going to total 100%, and we never lost any atoms. They're just a change in composition from an unstable um, radioactive element into the stable daughter. Okay, so our carbon-14, which is unstable, keeps changing into nitrogen-14, and every 5,700 years, half of them are going to change over. All right, so on our last, on our third half-life, we had two radioactive parents remaining. So again, half are going to change over. So one more of them is going to now flip over into nitrogen-14, leaving us just one radioactive um, element remaining. So we have one parent and 15 daughters in this, in this example. So we now only have one carbon-14 atom, and we have 15 nitrogen-14s. And our half-lives, we just do this half-life times the number of half-lives, and that tells us the age of the rock. So at four half-lives, if we find this ratio, we would have a rock that is 22,800 years old. So we're able to determine the age by looking at the ratio of your radioactive parent to your stable daughter elements. And that gives us the ratio and determines the amount of half-lives that have gone by. This is our half-life decay curve. And we're able to graph the number of half-lives to the fraction of elements present. And we could do this for both the parent isotope and the daughter product. So this curve is showing the decay. You can see that it's showing the amount of parent material. And it, of course, is decreasing because we lose parent material on each half-life. So you can see at your first, um, when you, the, the rock or the fossil first comes into existence, you have 100% of that parent remaining. At the first half-life, you're losing half. At the second half-life, you lose another half, and so on. So this is the curve that shows this relationship. You also can plot the, the, the increase in the daughter product. Okay, you end up with showing at zero, it's kind of exactly the opposite. At zero, you have zero daughter, right? When it first is born, it's all parent. At one half-life, you'd be at half, so this would be here. At the second half-life, you would have three quarters. And this ends up to be exactly opposite of the other curve. And what it ends up looking like, to me, is like a fish. And that's how you can kind of remember that this is your decay curve. Okay, so we're looking at the decay of the parent and the increasing daughter on the other line. So we're going to draw the general graph here. You're going to plot the points showing zero. You have about 100. At one half life, you lose half. Second half life, you've lost another half, so you'd be at about 25%. The third half-life, you'd be at 12.5%, and so on. So this is the general curve you're looking at for the decay. And then we're going to also plot 
that's the unstable atoms, so label that. And then you're also going to plot the stable atoms showing the increase in stable atoms. And this is where we see this little fishy that forms on our graph that can help you to keep that in mind. You're losing, st you're losing your radioactive unstable atoms and gaining your stable daughter atoms. So what radioactive isotope could be used to determine the absolute age of material that's recently living? So recently living, all living, all living things contain carbon, okay? All of them contain carbon. So that's your first clue. Your second clue is if it's recently living, which means we're looking at something that's less than 60,000 years old or so, we have to use something with a smaller half-life so that it's still, there's still carbon remaining. So carbon-14 is used for your recently living um, items, for remains of living organisms. Less than 50,000 years old is most useful. After that point, you'd have so little left, it might be hard to find or not really there anymore. Taking a look at your reference table, the half-life of uranium-238 is 4.5 times 10 to the 9. Um, so if you move your decimal over nine places, okay, you move your decimal nine places, that's one. You continue going eight more times, so you're adding eight zeros here. You get four billion, five hundred million years old. So 4.5 billion years old, which happens to be about the age of the Earth. So when we find uranium-238 in a rock, this is something that helps us date the age of the Earth as well. So... This is something that is useful for things that are really, really old, almost as old as the Earth. So here's a typical problem working with carbon-14 or any other radioactive isotope. So I'm going to show you the box method, which I think is a really simple way to learn how to do these problems. So the question is, if there's a 100-gram sample of carbon-14, how many grams of carbon-14 will remain after three half-lives? How long would this take? Show all work. So we're going to start off drawing a box to represent the original sample. The, this could be a rock. This could be a fossil. It doesn't really matter. Okay, you have 100 grams in the original sample, and this would be when it is zero years old. Okay, it was just born. So after one half-life, I'm going to draw an arrow and show this is after one half-life. We lose half of that carbon-14, so now it's 50 grams left of carbon-14. And how old would it be here? This would be at one half life, it would be 5,700 years old. Okay, on the next half life, no, notice it told us to do three, so we're going to do three. We lose half again, so we have 25 grams left of carbon-14. Okay, now that it's gone through two half lives, so you multiply 5,700 by two, and now it's going to be 11,400 years old. Also keep in mind that the other part of the rock didn't go anywhere. It's just changed. So the rest of the remaining 50 grams here, the other 50 grams would be nitrogen 14. And the other 75 grams here would be nitrogen 14. But they only asked us about the carbon 14. So that's why I don't have that in our little box. And on our third half life, we have 12 and a half grams of carbon 14 remaining. And so 5,700 times three is how we get to our next number which would give us 17,100 years. Okay, so I think we've actually answered both questions. I find that using these boxes and labeling the half-lives, okay, this is your half-life number, two half-lives and three half-lives, and then putting the amount in the boxes along with the gears on the bottom helps you to organize the information. Okay, and you also could just multiply simply three half-lives times the half-life amount, which is 5.7 times 10 to the 3, gives us our number of years, 17,100. And this uh, is the end of our notes for uh, radioactive decay. We have some more practice we'll do in class to make sure you get this. So no worries, and I will see you next time.